So this is no DBS, just a story. I'm just going to tell the story. I really don't care if you look at my slides or not. What I really want you to adore for two seconds is my Shishan Chauncey. He's a mixture between a Bichon Frieze and a Shih Tzu. And uh, we make him wear Michigan stuff all the time. That's a requirement in our house. All right. The only disclosure I have is a simple one that I've actually had for a long time. I do a promoting wellness talk, disease state awareness for Abby and, Abby and the Speakers Bureau where we just talk about diet and supplements. My objectives is something different. We want to give you a talk that you can't hear anywhere else. That is to just talk about what goes on outside of prostate cancer so you can understand why when I get together with David Crawford every year and we talk about predictions, I'm proud of my prediction record because I try to look outside of prostate where they're spending a lot of money in other cancers to give us an idea of what's going to happen in prostate in the future or how we should treat patients. So let's do a quick history lesson, which I guarantee you everybody would flunk this quiz and they should flunk this quiz because this is not known in prostate. You see, before prostate got all this money uh, to do some diet studies, breast cancer got a lot more money to do them earlier, and arguably they were more rigorous. And there's two randomized trials known in oncology and breast cancer after treatment to try to reduce the risk of recurrence. The first one was called the WIN study. And now look at the numbers. I just mentioned the meal study on active surveillance. Look at the numbers in these studies of randomization, and they're going five plus years. 2,437 patients with breast cancer treated to try to prevent recurrence. And then the Women's Healthy Eating and Living study, the WHEEL study, 3,088. So those are the two studies when I give a talk to breast cancer, public, or patients, or oncology, you have to know those two studies. And they're done. So what happens? in these studies to show us, can you reduce the risk of cancer recurrence with diet? Well, the WIN study was the winner. It showed a 24% significant reduction after five years in breast cancer recurrence after conventional treatment, but the other study did not. Why is that the case? Well, no one knows except here's my argument. After five years, the average weight loss was six pounds, and patients reduced their caloric intake. And even though their diet quality got better, what they did was reduce their quantity of calories. Now, in the wheel study, they did this idea that you're just going to eat more fruits and veggies. And there was no real weight change, no dramatic heart healthy changes. And maybe that's the reason why we did not see a reduced risk of recurrence. Interestingly enough, between the year 2000 and 2010, Memorial Sloan Kettering did a similar study like this to reduce the risk of colorectal polyps, where you just increased your veggies and fruits. And after eight years, there was no difference. So even though people are excited about the WIN study, because it's the one study in cancer, a randomized trial that showed you could reduce the risk of breast cancer recurrence, what people don't talk about enough, because it's very easy to get excited about diet, I get excited about diet, but you also got to be realistic about it. What was the number needed to, to treat to prevent one cancer recurrence? In other words, how many people may have to make all these dietary changes in order to reduce the risk of one breast cancer coming back? And everyone thinks, well, if I go on this diet, it's going to help me. It was 38. So if you have to have 38 of your patients make strong dietary changes where one benefits, is it worth it? I argue that in prostate cancer, even if we see a benefit, we won't get a number needed to treat of 38, or maybe we will. But the bottom line is, what happens to the other 37? I think the other 37, by not winning, can still win. And that should be the message going forward in diet, and I'll explain that in a minute. There was another active surveillance study done by UCSF and Dean Ornish, and it published in the Journal of Urology. It was a small study. Patients averaged 66 years of age. There was a lifestyle group that did mostly a plant-based diet. It's very aggressive. It was a good, heart-healthy study. And the control group, and that published in 2005. And they claimed to have seen some benefit in slowing progression. It wasn't as rigorous as some of the other randomized trials, but it was interesting. What people didn't talk about from this study was the average LDL drop with diet was 30 points. If you had a 30-point drop and you went to see your doctor, your doctor would be very excited, or you'd be on a statin to get that kind of drop. And the average weight loss 
was 10 pounds. So what I'm arguing is that the only hint in active surveillance that we see something that might be beneficial, you saw tremendous heart healthy changes with the dietary change. It wasn't just a quality game, it was also a quantity game. And this is the point going forward. I don't know if you saw this week, they've readjusted their calculations that now in 2030, half of America will have a BMI of 30 or higher. So we thought that would happen maybe in 2035 or 2040, but now by 2030, 50% of Americans will have a 30 or higher BMI. So the reality is, starting now and moving forward, eight to nine out of every 10 patients, regardless of where they are on the prostate cancer spectrum in the United States of America at least, are gonna need some assistance with weight loss. This has become the most pressing issue. And we know from over 85 published studies, and at least 50 of them are perspective, that there's some relationship between obesity and being diagnosed with prostate cancer aggressiveness. I don't know if it's because of this long-term continuous inflammatory state or this partial androgen deprivation that takes place. Whatever the reason, there seems to be a relationship not with incidence, but at least with aggressive disease and obesity. So, Here's the thought, lycopene, and we get all excited about it, and that's heart healthy, and then that leads to this meal study that was done by Parsons et al., which is a good study, but the idea was to increase your vegetable consumption. And I won't go into the details of it. Here's all the details of the study, and there was good compliance. And patients were excited, and they were extremely compliant. In fact, they cut back their caloric intake enough in the 24 months to be interesting, but no necessarily dramatic weight change or cholesterol change or something you could put in terms uh, your finger on in terms of a heart healthy parameter. And I don't want to leave this topic without also briefly mentioning the idea that people want magic potions. If diet's not going to do it, they want to take something over the counter. But I always remind people that when you take something over the counter and you don't do, a, do, don't do a rigorous clinical trial, you end up with stuff like this. Dr. Crawford and Donahue and others remember the drug called atrocentin. Well, Nelson from Pittsburgh did a study where he actually did a double-blind placebo-controlled trial for biochemical failure patients post-RP, and over 70% of the patients receiving placebo had a lengthened PSA doubling time. In other words, PSA goes up, it goes down, it moves around, and unless you have a comparison group, we really don't know what the hell is going on. And then the SELECT trial, the one thing that gets missed all the time, in the end, this trial actually taught people a lot throughout cancer, including in breast cancer. What people miss all the time is that Gleason scores of seven or more when you combine vitamin E and selenium was 1.23. That almost reached statistical significance. So had this trial been allowed to go on longer, you wonder whether or not it would have shown an increased risk of aggressive prostate cancer the more over-the-counter products you took. And in the meantime, in the past few years, bladder cancer has shown a similar profile with taking a lot of different things, including folic acid, may increase the risk of recurrence, that more is not better. And now breaking news from breast cancer in the past few weeks, one of the larger looks at patients taking a lot of supplements while they're receiving chemotherapy showed an increased risk of recurrence. So there's a theme going on again that taking all these things experimentally, while in the old days with my father, they used to say, well, can't hurt you. Well, the possibility is they can hurt you tremendously if you take the wrong thing. So now I want to finish off my talk with where I see diet going in the next 10 years and in your practice, and I'm going to show you why I believe this is the most holistic way to go. The greatest clinical trial in my profession of the past year was a trial no one heard about called Calorie. It was run by Duke University and several other sites. All they did after 10,000 people volunteered to be a part of either the control group or the intervention group is they said, we want you to reduce your caloric intake over two years by 25%. That's it. That's basically the rules, not too complicated. In the end, people don't want to reduce their caloric intake by 25%. They reduced it by about 11.9%. Good enough. But what you see here is their average BMI is 25. Look at the average weight loss after two years, 16 and a half pounds. The majority was fat mass, 11.9% caloric reduction. And then statistically significant changes in LDL, TC to HDL, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, inflammatory markers, blah, blah, blah. All this is heart healthy. And now there's been ancillary observations of improvement in mood, memory, reduced tension, relation, improved relationships, male sexual health, improvement in libido, sleep quality. 
So the question becomes, should it be as simple as looking at a patient today and saying, can you cut 250 calories or about 10% of your caloric intake? Maybe one of the biggest recommendations from one of the clinical trial participants in there and the pr principal investigator was just not eat after dinner. Maybe we should be making it that simplistic. And if you look at the metformin studies that get us all gaga about metformin, when you had metformin, the drug, you reduced your risk of type 2 diabetes by 31% after 3 years and 18% after 10 years. But with lifestyle changes, they reduced the risk of diabetes by 58% and 34% in the same trial. And everybody gets excited about the drug. What did they do that was so magical in this trial that nobody talks about? This group cut back their caloric intake. They were moving toward obesity by about 450 calories a day. That was the magic. If we're going to get excited about pills and prostate cancer, let's get excited about a pill that in the worst case scenario reduces your risk of the number one cause of death in men, which is cardiovascular disease. Let's quit chasing pills and products and diets that don't have that as a secondary benefit. Here's what I tell patients and different individuals who ask me about what's the latest on CBD. I tell them there's eight untold stories. Right now, in terms of chronic pain, these clinical trials are going on. I hope this works. But we only have one prescription approved. That's from the UK. It's called Epidiolex. GW Pharma is the name. It's really interesting because they have good quality control. I don't work with any of these companies. But that's the only one that's FDA approved, and they're opening up offices in the United States. And then, in terms of over-the-counter, a recent study by the University of Pennsylvania in 2017 in JAMA found that a large number of the over-the-counter products either had much more than they uh, advertised in there or much less, and some, many of the ones that said they were THC-free actually had THC in them. So there's a quality control issue going on. So if patients are going to go into a clinic or they're going to ask for CBD, ask it for a COA, which is a certificate of analysis. It means they were subject to some type of third-party testing. Number four is we don't know the drug interactions. And right now, with the anti-androgen pills, it's my guess we're going to see a number of drug interactions that basically compete in the same pathway that CBD does in terms of the liver and these anti-androgens we'll see. So we don't have the data on cancer. They're increasing the concentration of CBD. Does that mean it could cause addiction? We don't know. There's 150 registered clinical trials right now at clinicaltrials.gov, so we're going to get a lot. And my final point is we just got to take it easy and wait a few days, wait a few years, I mean, because if we wait a few years, what's going to play out is something perhaps you've heard of, which is called the placebo effect. What's amazing about some of these things is that if you talk to enough people taking some of this stuff, it doesn't matter what the disease is, you can find someone that's been cured within 48 hours of taking it. <laughs> Chronic pain, cured. ED, cured. Prostate cancer, cured. IBS, cured. We saw this in the 1990s with Viagra with a placebo response rate of 50% in some of these clinical trials. The more enthusiasm there is to gain access to a product, be it over-the-counter or prescription, the greater the placebo response in the initial clinical trials. So you have to let that play out for a few years, but we're seeing some placebo response rates in some of these clinical trials that are running 30 and 50% on average. And so it's important to mention these to patients. <clears throat> Sorry. Last slide. Here's the point in the next 10 years in your practice. Please let your diet of your patients focused on personalized preference. Whatever the hell they want to do, let them do. But keep in mind this. If you're losing a little bit of weight in these clinical trials, a 250 calorie pullback a day is where many of these were success successful. With ADT and other places where patients are approaching obesity, you're looking at 500 calories. Has to be the recommendation in order to maintain weight or lose weight. Yes, quality of diet is important, but quantity matters too if you've seen these clinical studies. Heart healthy is prostate healthy, first do no harm. We need to learn from these breast cancer studies that unless you get a cardiovascular change, then we generally don't see a change on the side of cancer. And then experimenting with a lot of things over the counter is not proven to improve heart health and should be discouraged. We never saw a benefit really of selenium in terms of heart health. The vitamin E data in heart health was very mixed. So the reality is if we're going to get excited about a supplement in the future, please let it be a supplement that either lowers cholesterol or reduces inflammation significantly or controls blood sugar or helps you lose weight. Number four, in the worst case scenario from future prostate cancer dietary clinical research, the worst case scenario, 
either the primary or the secondary endpoint should be a heart healthy change in terms of some kind of parameter. If it ain't changing LDL, if it ain't changing glucose, if it ain't changing blood pressure, I'm not so sure people should do that kind of dietary study in prostate cancer going forward with what we know. Number five, if people want to get involved in the CBD game or the supplement game, always look for a certificate of analysis. This means a third party came in and checked that company that what they're saying to you was actually proven by a third party group. In the supplement world, we have lots of these companies that you can read about. I just did the latest AUA update, NSF, USP, um, BSCG, we have a ton of them out there and the companies need to subscribe to these. And last but not least, Michigan is going to win the national title in football <laughs> sometimes in the next 500 to 600 years, I believe that will take place. And one more thing before I let Dr. Burnett come up here and give his talk. If another person comes to me at this meeting and asks me what they should produce or buy in order to have a healthy Super Bowl party, I'm going to scream. Here is my answer. If you are planning on having a healthy Super Bowl party, don't invite me. The Super Bowl party is meant to be unhealthy. For God's sakes, let it go for one freaking day. Thank you very much.